Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, hello. I've got to hit play on this thing. And then we can get started. How are you feeling today? All right, good. It's good to see all of your faces. I'm going to take us back for a second to the 60s and specifically to a dinner party um, in New York City. A guy named Lloyd Morissette, on the recommendation of a friend of his, went to a dinner party hosted by Joan Gans Cooney. At the time, Lloyd was the vice president of the Carnegie Corporation, which is a, um, uh, working in fundraising and philanthropy. And Joan um, was the producer at WNET, which is a public broadcasting of uh, New York, She's a producer of television programming. And they got in this conversation about how Lloyd's kids on Saturday mornings would always be watching TV, but could for some reason remember the jingles in commercials or the theme songs of cartoons more than they could remember their ABCs counting one to 10. So he and Joan were talking about how there was this new technology showing up in every single home, and it was addictive. It was the TV. And the TV had uh, some kind of hold. It was like the screen on kids in particular. And clearly they were able to retain information, but maybe not the information that would help to forward a kid's education. So, at the time, the context of the situation was really interesting because there was this guy who was the chairman of the FCC, his name was Newton Minow, and he said, hey, everything on TV is basically garbage, okay? It's formulaic, there's a lot of violence, kids programming is generally cartoons, that is, again, centered around violence, and then all of the advertisements that are really driving television are also formulaic, and it's just about driving consumer culture. And he said, certainly there's something we could do differently. If you want to look up this speech, it's literally called the vast wasteland speech. That's how he characterized TV in the 60s. There's this amazing technology showing up in homes, and the programming is garbage. So what could we do? So this dinner party, Lloyd and Joan are talking and uh, decide that they want to try to do something about that. So they brought together this really diverse team of people. They put them in a room and said, could we use television to teach kids? And Lloyd raised money, and Joan, as a TV producer, started calling her friends, and Lloyd started calling his friends, and they brought in child psychologists and curriculum designers and TV producers and musicians and uh, an eclectic group of people who had a singular focus on being able to connect with the human on the other side of the interface. Their mission was to use technology to connect with the human on the other side of the interface and they got rigorous about it. They tested tiny bits of content that they would produce and put in front of the urban kids who they decided were the focus of this work because those urban kids were having a hard time keeping up with their more affluent suburban counterparts, particularly as they were entering school. So they were already a step behind. What if we could use TV to reach those kids? Well, we would need to make sure that that programming reflects the nature and the context, the emotional context of the kids we're trying to reach. So they took hyper-focused, tiny segments of content and tested them over and over again and iterated on them until they were able to definitively say that the kid watching the TV was learning. And they had ways of measuring how the kid was learning. But what they found along the way is that the programming needed to reflect reality just enough that it could be something that the kids would deem trustworthy. It had to look a little bit familiar in order for them to know that this was authentic, it was meant for them, they could see themselves in it. When they trusted the programming, 
they were more likely to learn. What am I talking about right now? Come on. Sesame Street! This is how Sesame Street started. When Sesame Street, from that dinner party in 1966 to November 1969, when it launched its first episodes, it was three years of fundraising and intensive behavioral research and development aimed at the youngest populations in urban environments. And it was done by the most eclectic group of people you could possibly put in a room, who would never be in a room if you took this on as an intellectual technology endeavor. This was a social good enterprise from the start. In fact, they got turned down by so many networks because they had no revenue model that aligned to any of the networks, just like Zeta was showing yesterday. It was impractical. It didn't seem like this is something. But Newton Minow, in that vast wasteland speech, had created the environment to set up what became the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and then the Public Broadcasting Service in the United States, which was distributing the, this content for free to reach those kids. And that group of people who were in those early planning days, they found that, for example, kids from abused homes, which is a huge part of the population they were trying to reach, didn't trust adults. So they were more likely to speak to a sock with eyeballs on a human's hand than they were to the human that that hand was attached to. That's why puppets got introduced to Sesame Street. The characters, the characters, African-American, Hispanic, white characters, old, young characters, reflecting the dif different diverse populations they were trying to reach. The puppets were really reflecting the, the consciousness of the kids, but they found that they had to balance the amount of time that the humans and the puppets were actually in segments together, because if it ended up being humans only, the kids would lose interest, and if it ended up be, being puppets only, the kids would lose interest. There had to be this dialogue. That's how kids were learning, how to trust the adults, how to learn from adults, how to start into their schooling system, really trained to be able to learn. So I'm going to show you a very early segment. This is a young James Earl Jones, and he's going to count to 10. Ready? One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> the researchers knew the kids were learning because they started counting out loud the next number in the sequence but only when literally everything that James Earl Jones just did happened. And they tested a bunch of different segments. If he waited four seconds or two seconds, they wouldn't start counting out loud. He waited three seconds in between each. He had to have his facial expression be neutral, as the kids kind of, for those first few numbers in the segment, and then he had to start reflecting different emotions. This is bananas. The level of rigor and discipline and intensive focus on making sure that the programming was authentic and it represented something that could connect with the humans, the little humans, who are every single day in their environments dealing with things like you even heard in the background, honking horns, and the stoop that was designed with some dirt on it, and the trash that even included a character that was just part of the regular context. It was such an intensive focus on getting into the shoes of the people they were trying to reach and understanding the context that they were dealing with to reflect that back in the programming to meet this goal. And that's the thing I've been inspired by ever since I learned about everything that went into Sesame Street 
How could I reflect that in the work I'm doing? How could we create a really diverse team? People who maybe shouldn't actually be together normally, but you put them in a room and you challenge them with a vision to reach a human on the other side of the interface to do something good, to do something good with that. Empowering that diverse team to do something to connect with the humans, but design it authentically. This isn't about clicks or taps or eyeballs. This is about representing something that's going to be lasting and has meaning. So it stands a test of time. I mean, Sesame Street is being honored at the Kennedy Center in November for 50 years. They've expanded into new markets. They've taken on new social content. They've taught kids all along using technology, first with the TV. And then, as they got better and better at understanding, going through this build, measure, learn loop with the content they were producing for the kids, extending as the technology started to evolve into new homes, extending into new kinds of content. The electric company was an early experiment to try to reach kids just above the target age, five to eight. The electric company used a lot of the same formulas that Sesame Street pioneered for the three to five-year-olds and tried to extend it to the five, five to eight-year-old audience. And as new technologies came, of course, they started to get into things like video games. They started to get into things like iPads, another very addictive interface, especially for kids. And they started getting into content like what happens in natural disasters. And just a few years ago, they, first, they released their first autistic character. But they didn't start here. They started with James Earl Jones counting to 10, and the ABCs, and that's what their mission was, is hyper-focus on being able to help kids learn. And only over time were they then expanding very specifically and strategically into different kinds of contexts. Trust is at the heart of these meaningful experiences. To design for it, we have to embrace human emotions which is so hard and messy, and it sounds like, oh, that's nice to have, but like, it doesn't scale, and the technology doesn't, and it's too personalized, and we like, reject it because it's at the workplace, or we think maybe it's going to have to be too bespoke, because human emotion is so... What is it? What is it? It's so completely unique just unique. But that's why it's universal. We all have it. So, as Jamin was talking about in my role now over the last uh, few years, I've been focusing on the application of machine learning to customer experience. Because now, Theoretically, here's a new way of using technology to connect with a human on the other side of the interface. And if only we set up the systems, that is, the people and the technology, to be able to design for endless contexts, we actually have the ability to do it now, to create adaptive experiences that can be responsive to different people in different contexts, depending upon, in our case at Capital One, their relationship to money how they move through the world, what they want and don't want from their relationship with their bank. So a few years ago, Capital One, uh, we released an intelligent assistant called Eno. Eno is the number one spelled backwards. Nobody likes that. Thank you, Nick Crampton, who works at Capital One, for the laugh. Uh, OK. <laughs> and the thing about Eno is, very specifically, we wanted a character that didn't reinforce pre-existing um, uh, gendered notions of who manages money, and who's good with money, and who isn't good with money, and that just wasn't going to be part of the relationship that we wanted to instill 
between the customer and this new assistant that we were creating. So we made that choice all the way up through the C-suite. People agreed, we're going to buck the trend of these female gendered assistants, and we're going to be gender neutral. That's the way to go. And then we spent another year making the technology work and focusing on the use cases that customers would be able to interact with. And there were two of them. You could check your balance and you could pay your credit card bill. And we understood how people, we were only focused on SMS, texting, because it was the most ubiquitous, most accessible uh, channel for reaching our customers. And when we launched, so we watched their behavior, and when we launched, we, we couldn't have imagined the reception that we were going to get that was around those two decisions, that is, choosing to be gender neutral and also choosing to stay in the SMS channel where mobile behavior would enable us to have emojis, which are naturally emotional, tonal kinds of responses. But that's what the headlines that started generating after we launched Eno it wasn't about the technology, it was about the, connect the connection in the context of this technology. Avoiding bias with gender-neutral chatbot, a sense of humor and won't stand for rudeness, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Capital One launches Eno, gender-neutral virtuous system. You can manage your bank account with emojis. The future of AI is genderless. What if our future AI helpers were designed to have no gender at all? Should chat, chatbots be sexless? For the sake of diversity and inclusion, chatbots should be gender... These were the kinds of headlines that were coming up because of the choices that we made. And we did it with an eclectic group of people, a small group of people early on. We had somebody who used to work at the Chicago Sun, was the youngest editor at the Chicago Sun, somebody who did character design and development for Pixar and Lucasfilm and worked on Ratatouille. We had somebody who used to own a bakery shop and a, fixes motorcycles and then was, became a self-taught designer. Somebody who's an anthropologist who used to work at Xerox Park in their labs. And we put him in a room and said, how do we go about taking something that is really transactional? Because money is transactional. And the natural thing to do is to design use cases just like this. We need to be able to understand and respond to questions like this. What's my balance? When is my bill due? I need to move money. I want a credit. And of course, people ask these transactional questions. But they also ask them in these ways, with fear, with emotion. I just got a fraud alert. I'm scared. Someone stole my identity. I'm overseas. I'm locked out of my account. Exclamation points. I'm afraid to ask my balance. Just got paid. Holla! <laughs> this is who we were designing for. If only we were willing to pay attention to the color, it's so much easier to follow the formula to look at what works, to do what we know, and respond to that. And we absolutely have to. But what makes it special, different, meaningful, more connective, more trustworthy, is that we've taken the extra time to understand and design for the emotion, the emotion and the humanity. I'm going to show you a few of the iterations that we started with. For example, this was the first welcome message you would get. This was. Our first attempt, hi, I'm your texting virtual assistant, didn't have a name yet. I can help you do things like these transactional things. <laughs> Want to stop talking? No problem. What's up? Oh, I didn't understand. <coughs> OK. But we were like, it's working. <laughs> I texted this number, and this thing came back. We were so excited. We were so excited. OK, so we have a little work to do. So then two months later, we added a little bit more flavor. Now it's personalized. Spef, that's my nickname. I'm your Capital One assistant, some stuff. OK, I, sorry, I, I curse a little bit in these. I should have warned you. Looks like you're giving me the thumbs up. 
Oh my gosh, I love that what I just said maps to the thumbs up answer. Epic. I love you too. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. These were responses that we had given Eno that were full of emotion. Trying to strike that balance between what we want to establish and expect, and our customers expect from us, which is we have a trustworthy relationship, we have your money, but also conversational enough that we can get into a dialogue. So on launch day, we ended up being a little bit more verbose. Hi, it's great to meet you. First things first. Here's a bunch of legalese. More importantly, I'm here to talk with you about your money, and if you happen to like abbreviations or emojis, that works for me. Text bow. So now, the welcome message, looking back on it, we lost our way a little here, okay? <laughs> This is quite a welcome. It takes up your whole interface. You have to scroll, because we are so welcoming. <laughs> um, And what really showed us that, you know, best of intentions here, really trying to make you feel warm, you're coming into our home, was this little thing down here, if you look B-A-L in the bottom right. What that ended up showing up to us as when we first launched, and you only get one shot at the first time user experience, right? And people really actually do want to believe that this thing is going to work. And they're willing to give you their time and their belief. And, oh, if you can just be there and respond in that first moment, it's really magical. Unfortunately, we forgot that Bao would autocorrect to nap. <laughs> and also the keyboard, you know, B-A-L is really close to N-A-P on the keyboard. So, The first time user experience for many folks, until we actually took that word and mapped it to the balance response, was, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your request. <laughs> What we probably should have said is, oh, you want a nap? Sure, we can give you the close. We didn't do any of that either, obviously. And as we started to uh, get more customers using Eno, and we started expanding into different contexts, we found how very quickly we would fail because one context is not like another, which seems obvious, of course. The technology needs to be custom to both because in your general texting behavior, it turns out when you're communicating with us as your bank, it's about 21 characters that you would use as a max. But when you go to a keyboard, you go to 74. Because when you're texting, you're saying things transactionally quick, short. And when you go to your keyboard, you're telling us your life story about where you're going to travel and why you're going there and why you want to make sure that your card doesn't get declined while you're traveling, which is lovely, but Eno is very new and doesn't yet understand multiple intents. So we weren't failing, or we were failing on those things. One of those headlines in the earlier slide that, that said, uh, you know, doesn't stand for rudeness is because we decided as a team that we wanted to create boundaries as we were reading headlines about how kids generally were yelling at their Alexas at home and their uh, tones were kind of um, maybe a little more aggressive and maybe we were teaching kids to be rude to the robots when there were like actually humans behind the robots who have feelings. And so we set boundaries for Eno. You can't sexually harass Eno. It is a little dismaying how many people, when, generally when Eno doesn't respond to a request that they want, how very quickly people can switch to hateful kinds of inputs. And so Eno says, hey, not really sure this is the conversation I want to be in, so let me know when you want to get back to talking about your money. And if they do it again, they say, you're welcome to call our customer service agents because generally people won't pick up the phone and wait on hold. To they're just angry and they're trying to get it out. Now imagine <clears throat> a room of people whose job for two hours was to discuss all of the ways that sexual harassment or aggressive language could come through. 
we had to whiteboard everything. The post-it notes that showed up in the recycling bin that night, if anybody looked through them, would have been like, what was this meeting? <laughs> it is not work appropriate. But that's what an eclectic group of people understanding that context and having a commi commitment to that vision are willing to do. And again, like humor, it's very easy to break trust if you insert humor at the wrong time. And so there are some contexts, like when somebody says, tell me a joke, Eno, where we've got a green light to tell, usually a pretty bad money pun, but a joke. And then there are some contexts, like a fraud scenario, where some of the natural humor-based or more informal kinds of language can actually break trust. And so understanding when to dial up and dial down the humor or the formality, this really contributes to whether or not the experience is as trustworthy as it can be. So this is how we, in developing Eno, really attempted to take a diverse team of people, get them designing authentically, on behalf of manifesting Capital One's values, but also in reaching our customers, and then using technology, first in SMS, and then we expanded into our web and mobile apps, into the call center, to connect with the customers. It's not about the technology, it's about the customers on the other side of that interface. And the thing that kept us uh, sort of focused on that was we had something called the I love you metric, and it was just a constant regrounding of the ways in which people who were satisfied customers would say, I love you, Eno. Or thank you. We've had marriage invitations. <laughs> We've uh, been invited to weddings and to Thanksgiving and to Easter dinner. And these are the kinds of metrics, uh, ratings and reviews that you would have as standard, and you absolutely need them, but also keeping in mind the human emotional metrics that we can measure side by side. This was our version of learning. Were we connecting with the human on the other side? Were they having a great experience? And there's nothing like working in AI, by the way, that keeps you more humble. Um, this is more recently, hey, what about my card? Happy to share that with you. Dear God, you know, you're getting so good. You made my day. And by the way, I think you're pretty cool too. Holy shit! I didn't understand your request. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. It was really about embracing human emotion. How do we design with it? How do we design for it? And I'll close with a story of a, and so we, we talked about TV, we talked about AI and assistance in web and mobile environments, but video games is another inspirational, can be another inspirational place for the outliers who have moved away from the trends and the formulas of first-person shooters, and everything is explained, and you've got, uh, you, you kill things, and you die, and you come back to life, and you, and there's obviously a market for those things. But a guy by the name of Jinova Chen thought maybe there was something untapped here. Again, video games can be addictive and people can pay attention to them, and they can spend long hours in front of them, how can you use that technology to connect with a human on the other side of the interface in a way that is more emotional, more deeply emotional, more deeply human, than goal-oriented? And Genova Chen uh, uh, runs a company called That Game Company, and when he was a grad student, he designed a prototype of a game had, like, no violence to it, and it ended up being wildly popular in the indie circles. And Sony got a hold of him and said, will you please create a higher fidelity version of this game? And uh, we'll release it as Sony, you know, and as a, as a that game company um, uh, game. And he said, uh, sure, and he put together a group of people, and they had a couple years to do it. And this is a trailer. It came out about five years ago now, but this is a trailer that shows you what that game looks like.
you feel? Zen? Yeah, that's right. I thought, isn't it apropos that that video game is called Journey and we're at the service design conference? <laughs> when this game came out, a year after it was supposed to. The video game reviewers, it was like people didn't know how to talk about it, but they talked about it in, in things that were about uh, human emotion. They were fascinated by this game. They were recommending this game. This game was recommended to me by a friend. Saying things like this, there's no tutorial, there's no prompt. Nothing pops up on screen. Nobody tells you where you're going or why. The storytelling is purely about the game experience itself. And very specifically, the entire game, everything that you can do in that game, unlike nearly every other video game out there, is boiled down to three actions. One of them is that you can sing. There's Anybody, I don't want to. I'm like, I love this game so much, I don't want to ruin it for anybody who needs to leave this room and go play it as soon as we're done. So I'm trying to temper myself right now. So I'll just say every element was designed to have a function to evoke emotion and to connect with the player, including the scarf that's flowing is about life, it's about energy. When another player shows up in the screen, came up over top of the mountain, and they were running together, turns out that's another player in the actual world. And they have designed the game to come in and out and let people come in and out of each other's lives, which is just like real life. <laughs> <laughs> and the music, they had People come in and play the music and recast the music and recast the music until they were getting the music right. And similar to Sesame Street, similar to our I Love You metric, the one thing that they wanted to see and why it was late was they wanted to see the players be moved emotionally. They were willing to be late to get it right. They were willing to be over budget, which they were, to get it right but they wanted most players to cry, which, again, seems quite impractical, all right? But I only know about this, the story of what went into to Journey, because when I got done playing that game, I was bawling <laughs> like a child. It was the most incredible three hours of gameplay of my entire life and has set the bar of what I know is possible if somebody loves the craft of their work and is so committed to connecting to the human on the other side of the interface that this happened. And I was so struck by it, I remember my husband was sitting there and I was like, honey, oh my God, taking a picture of my own eyeballs 
which my plan was to just tell my friend who recommended this to me and go like, look what that game did to me. And it really inspired this journey, no pun intended, that I've taken to understand what goes into making those kinds of really magical things. That like, I would trust this creator from now on, anything that Genova Chen puts out and that game company puts out, I'm, I'm in. I'm a big fan. Forever. But Sesame Street, same thing. Because their commitment to ins instilling their emotion in their work to pull, connect with, and pull out the emotion on the other side of the interface is just astounding to me. It's so rare. And I think it takes really mundane kinds of things. People in a room together. A willingness to talk to people and get into the messiness of people. And some technology as an enabler, not as the end game, but as an enabler to really facilitate human connection on either side of the interface. When we get it right, as a bank, by the way, it sounds a little something like this. I'm going to show you a video. You're going to hear my voice easily, unfortunately. And the person you should be listening to is the person who's on the video. And there's some background noise, so I'm going to ask you to like really focus on what he's saying. Ready? What's your name? Lloyd Morrissey. Huh? Lloyd, how did you feel when your wife bought all those things while you were in the board meetings, and then you got an email asking you to approve the transactions. Well, I was really glad to get the email and know that Capital One was on the ball in checking fraud. I had no problem because all I had to do was press one button and said, yes, I do recognize those transactions. They make you feel good? It made me feel pretty good. I thought that we were safe. Thank you. Also, do you think Steph Hay is like the coolest person ever? <laughs> Why are you hesitating? I have to think about that. <laughs> All right. He said, I felt safe. I felt safe. He was at board meetings in New York City. His wife was out. They normally live in California. This was happening on the other coast. He got a fraud notification. I felt safe. Capital One was on the ball. That's what happens when we get it right. Does anybody recognize this person? Does this help? Or maybe this help? Yeah, the co-founder of Sesame Street is a Capital One customer? <laughs> what? I know about Sesame Street because Lloyd is one of my best friends. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> we get to Skype every Sunday. I studied Sesame Street in grad school a long time ago. And one of my grad school professors said, hey, maybe the original team of Sesame Street is around and they'd be willing to ask your questions. So I started calling every Lloyd Morissette in the phone book in New York, and I found him. And uh, he appreciated my gumption, <laughs> gave me his email address, and uh, now he's one of my best friends. So I have um, uh, really a, like most joy ever that they're getting honored in November for this work, because I know everything about this person and everything that went into this work, and you can't just, uh, you can't fake that. It's gotta be authentic. And that ultimately brings me back to my first point, which is when you're willing to understand and design for human contexts, really the mess of them. That's how we can create things that last. That's how we can enable trust and connect with a human on the other side of the interface. Thank you.